Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. Light and peace in Jesus Christ our Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Almighty God, we give thee thanks for surrounding us as daylight fades with the brightness of the vesper light. And we implore thee of thy great mercy, that as thou dost enfold us with the radiance of this light, so thou wouldst shine into our hearts the brightness of thy Holy Spirit, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Genesis. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as they migrated from the east, they came upon a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we shall be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower which mortals had built. And the Lord said, Look, they are one people, and they all have one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do. Nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language there, so that they will not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad for, from there over the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore it was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. The word of the Lord. Thanks to God.
said, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female slaves in those days, I will pour out my spirit. I will show portents in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved, for in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be those who escape, as the Lord has said, and among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Surely it is God who saves me. I will trust in him and not be afraid. For the Lord is my stronghold and my sure defense, and he will be my Savior. Therefore you shall draw water with rejoicing from the springs of salvation. And on that day you shall say, Give thanks to the Lord and call upon his name. Make his deeds known among the peoples. See that they remember that his name is exalted. Sing the praises of the Lord, for he has done great things. And this is known in all the world. Cry aloud, inhabitants of Zion, ring out your joy. For the Great One in the midst of you is the Holy One of Israel. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues, as of fire, appeared among them, and the tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem, and at this sound the crowd gathered and was bewildered, because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, each 
our own, in our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Come, Holy Ghost, our souls inspire, and lighten with celestial fire. The So 
what we're doing tonight is both very traditional and also a bit of a new experience for most of us, even me. One of the things that distinguishes these vigil services is that they have more readings, and particularly they dig more deeply into the Old Testament stories that foreshadow the major themes and events of the feast we're celebrating. And the first reading tonight is an especially good example of that. The only time, the only time in the whole lectionary that we have an opportunity to hear the story of the Tower of Babel in church is at the Vigil of Pentecost. If we didn't have this vigil, it probably would never be heard. It's a story many people know, but not one that the preacher ever gets to explore. But tonight, I can. Hooray. Now, the story of the Tower, Tower of Babel really is the Old Testament foundation for the story of Pentecost, which we celebrate today. The story of the Tower of Babel tells about the origin of different languages and nations in the world. And even more to the point, it tells about the breakdown, or the breakup, if you will, of human community. The story of Pentecost, on the other hand, tells how God overcomes all human divisions, not just language barriers, and creates a new community, the kingdom of God. The story of the Tower of Babel begins where so many biblical stories begin, with human pride. The story tells how, in that time, humanity was afflicted with the sin of pride, and people thought that they could build a tower all the way up to heaven. In a way, it's a repeat of the story of the Garden of Eden. You remember, of course, how the serpent tempted Eve. He told her that if she ate the fruit of the tree of knowledge, she would be like God. A pretty tempting prospect. So she and Adam gave in to temptation and ate the fruit. And as a result, God banished her and Adam from the garden. In the city of Babel, people thought that they could reach all the way to heaven to challenge God. They thought that by building a tower to heaven, they would prove themselves to be like God. Different people, different time, different place, same old story. But God threw a monkey wrench into their plan, and he made the people of Babel all speak different languages so they could no longer understand one another. They could no longer communicate. Confusion ensued, and they all ended up leaving the wonderful city they had been building, banishing themselves from it and from one another. Language is essential to accomplishing the more complicated tasks of human endeavor. And if we cannot communicate ad adequately, the result is likely to be confusion. And that's what happened at Babel. The confusion brought an end to their grand schemes and to ordinary, rela ordinary relationships as well. People couldn't communicate. People couldn't relate. And as a result, the people scattered. They left town and went wandering. The result of their confusion was the founding of new nations where people could communicate with one another, but not with neighboring nations. So instead of a single great city at the heart of a single great and unified nation, the world experienced division. And this led to competition, then war, another manifestation of the pride which continually leads to the downfall of humanity. The story of Pentecost is the story of how God fixes the confu confusion that had resulted from human pride. As the day of Pentecost dawned, people were gathered in Jerusalem, another great city, gathered from all over the world. They had been drawn there by God from the many places to which they had scattered after the debacle of Babel. And in spite of the fact that they spoke many different languages, the remarkable thing that happened was that they all were able to understand what the apostles were saying. They all heard in their own languages the good news of God in Christ. And this event is the foundation of a new unified people, a new community, the kingdom of God, a kingdom in which confusion and division, competition and war are destined to come to an end. 
When we think of the events of that first Pentecost, it may be that unity and peace are not the first things that come to mind. Consider what happened. There's a great roaring sound, like a great wind rushing through the city. There are weird visions, flames dancing over the heads of the apostles. And when everyone comes to see what is going on, they hear these humble fishermen from Galilee speaking in languages they had never spoken before. Our first impression of this scene is likely to be one of more confusion. People come rushing together from all over the city. There is amazement and astonishment. And everyone is confused. No one really understands what is going on. Some are convinced that the, the apostles must be drunk. Not a very propitious beginning for the kingdom of God. But appearances can be deceiving. Since this service is in a video format, I'm able to display on the screen an icon, which is presently on the altar, which shows the apostles, together with the Blessed Virgin Mary, on the day of Pentecost. You know my fondness for icons, and icons are not just pictures. They are very theological. And that's certainly the case with this icon. If there were not certain clues in the icon, you might not realize that it depicts the day of Pentecost. The tongues of fire are there, but they're not over the heads of each of the apostles. Rather, they are rather tiny and are all clustered together at the top of the icon. The apostles don't look agitated at all. They certainly don't look drunk. In fact, they look very focused and quiet. They look peaceful. Obviously, this is not a picture of the way things appeared to the crowd when they came together on Pentecost. What it is, however, is a picture of the truth. And the truth is that the Holy Spirit came not to create chaos, but order. Not to divide, but to unite. Not to disturb, but to give peace. Not to confuse, but to reveal the truth. And this, in turn, is a picture of what it means to be the church. The Holy Spirit fills the church and comes to each of us in baptism. And her work is the same, both in individuals and in the church as a whole, to bring order and to make whole, to give peace and to teach. It's important to realize that the Spirit is always present in the church, but we must also recognize that we continue to be sinners. We are redeemed from sin, but we have not yet been perfected. So as a result, we sometimes resist the Spirit. That means that the church as a whole and individuals within it never entirely resemble the finished product, as it were. And yet we know what the finished product is supposed to look like. And it is our job to strive to achieve it by allowing God's Spirit to work within us, bringing us ever more and more into the fullness of the image of God. Adam and Eve and the people of Babel all wanted to be like God. In fact, we are created in the image of God, and it is not a bad thing to want to be like God. But we cannot achieve that on our own terms. Our terms include, first of all, pride. Building ourselves up, thinking ourselves better than we are, thinking ourselves better than others. That is not at all like God who humbled himself to take on our flesh and to die. Our terms include wanting to be in control, competing with others for power and position, putting other people down and causing conflict and division when we cannot get what we want. That is not at all like God either, whose kingship was made known in a stable and on a cross, and whose power was made known in weakness and in death. Our terms always seem to include keeping the pot stirred up, complaining when we don't like the way things are, criticizing those with whom we disagree, getting angry when we do not get our own way. And that is not at all like God either, whose son would not allow his disciples to defend him with swords, and who healed the wounded servant of his accusers, who gave the apostles the power to preach in languages 
that everyone could understand, and who gives a peace which is beyond understanding to those who receive him and love. Whether we want to think of the larger church with all of its controversies and issues, or our local parish with its challenges and needs, the agenda is clear. It is set for us by the remarkable events of the day on which the church was born. Much of what we fight about in the larger church relates to the questions of truth. Jesus promised that the Spirit would lead us into all truth, and truth is certainly a key element in what it means to be the church. What we too often seem to miss is that we are never going to come to the truth by posturing and arguing about it. We will come to the truth when we learn to speak one another's language, and when we learn to listen, first of all, to God, and secondly, but equally importantly, to one another. You see, as I often say, the truth is not a theory or a proposition. The truth is Jesus Christ. To know Him is to know something far more profound than any theory or proposition. To know Him is indeed to know that peace which breaks down barriers and unites. To know Him is to have our brokenness healed. To know Him is to find ourselves as members of a new family, a new community, a new people, in which confusion and division and dissension fade away. When those things are happening, when we know peace within ourselves and within the Church, then we know that the Holy Spirit is alive and working within us. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, Eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the cross. We believe in one of the Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for Christ's Church and the world. Holy Father, we pray for thy Holy Catholic Church. Fill it with thy spirit and make it one. Grant that every member of thy church may die daily to sin. Create in us new and contrite hearts. Pour thy spirit upon all bishops, priests, and deacons. That they may be faithful ministers of thy word and sacraments. Give grace and wisdom to all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. That justice may flow down like water, and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Break the bonds of conflict and oppression, racism and hate among the peoples of the world, that this world may become thy peaceable kingdom. We pray especially for the sick and the dying, the lonely and the afflicted, refugees, hostages, and prisoners, that they may find rest for their souls and healing for all their wounds. We also pray for those who are victims of discrimination and violence because of their gender, their religion, their race, or their sexual orientation. Make us instruments of thy peace and bearers of thy love. Shed the new light of the resurrection on all who have died, that with all the saints they may share in thy heavenly kingdom. 
Almighty God, who on this day has opened the way of eternal life to every race and nation by the promised gift of the Holy Spirit, shed abroad this gift throughout the world by the preaching of the gospel, that it may reach to the ends of the earth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the same Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ hath taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Let us bless the Lord, Alleluia, Alleluia. 